Hello, David Zritsky for the Bond Experience. Welcome back. Well, you can see the gentleman before me, and I don't want you to get nervous. Uh, Calvin and I, even after all of these hellacious, dragged down, bloody debates, we remain very good friends. Is that right, Calvin? Just about, yeah. As soon as the scars start to heal and the stitches come out of the wounds, then, you know, things are forgotten by that point, usually. <laughs> and, and I think you've always said to me, you, you, you don't forget, but you do forgive. And I really do appreciate that. <laughs> it's maniacal. It's terrible. <laughs> All right, but you know what happens is, and I've got to explain the the organic nature of these conversations, because when Calvin and I get into these conversations like about Quantum of Solace and then Moonraker, typically we'll bring up another film, and then suddenly there's this almost audible special effects screeching halt noise, and we go, wait a minute, how can you dislike that film? And he'll say, how can you like that film? And well, we're here today to talk about Thunderball. So the year, the year, is 1965. Um, a, a little $9 million film makes $142 million, more than its predecessors and more than the next five Bond movies to come. So clearly it's very popular, except for one young gentleman in England named Calvin Dyson, who in study of this debate, I went back and watched his other reviews of Thunderball. And I quote, <laughs> I effing hate Thunderball. It is shit, shit, shit. And I will tell you why it's shit. So based on that wonderful quote from three to six years ago, uh, Calvin, let's start the conversation. Yeah. <laughs> What a thing to start off on. Oh, that's I was wondering if you were going to go back and look at some of those older, more provocative videos. <laughs> By the way, your whole voice inflection has changed. The, the one that I heard six years ago, it almost took me back to hear your voice. Your, your voice uh, tone and tenor is totally different now. Well, I guess it was a bit of a different style of video making at the time. Um, certainly, I was very influenced by a whole bunch of people on the That Guys With The Glasses website where review videos were sort of more about being in a sort of heightened state of almost like your character, basically. So yeah. that was a lot of, uh, yeah, so that's perhaps why some of those early videos are a bit more provocative and some of the language is not language that I would use these days. Well, and, and to that point, I'm really curious today in this conversation, if you're going to be, because you're older, wiser, more mature, more experienced, are you going to be somewhat kinder? I mean, I was motivated to wear this armband. Let me uh, get up <laughs> so you can see it. Ah, that's brilliant. Uh, just just because I almost felt like, you know, to you, there was like a, a death of Thunderball. Um, so but we'll see. And by the way, um, it is 9 a.m. in the morning when we're recording this. All right. And yet, because, you know, Calvin is an enabler. I can call him that. Um, I have chosen today for my morning drink a, uh, a rum Collins, just like they drink in the movie. Same proportions. It's got some light rum. It's got some sugar. Um, it's got uh, splashes of soda and um, obviously, you know, some some lemon. And uh, it, it's absolutely delicious. But what does what does Calvin drink? Calvin does not drink. Calvin does not make love. What does Calvin do? <laughs> no, what are you drinking today? I am with my old faithful Jack Daniels and Coke Zero. So nice. that's... Uh... Yeah, but but it's you know it's two o'clock here, so I can just about get away with it. But I think I need to start drinking at your time in future. I like the sound of a cocktail at nine o'clock. Listen, as a fifty-two-year-old, I can tell you it can only benefit the day. <laughs> Cheers. It adds a sparkle to the day. Oh God, I'll stop quoting. <laughs> All right, so let's get right down to it because we're going to do it a little bit differently. We've done it in the past, and I do have some breakdowns. I mean, as usual, I've got. Lots of different topics and notes, but I, I want to do, I want to start off a little bit differently because, and maybe it's because I did listen to your other reviews. Um, tell me overall, I mean, you, you really do have a, a certain, you know, disdain for this film, maybe just as an umbrella statement. Talk to me about Thunderball. Oh God, where to begin? Um, <laughs> yeah, this is one that I've never really connected with at all like throughout you know the years and you rewatch some films and there are some like license to kill for instance is one for me that i used to really you know dog on and now it's like oh no actually i think it's actually really good and there's an awful lot in it thunderball is one of those that's always been 
really low ranking for me and I've never really connected with it. Um, there's some elements that I connect with. I guess we'll get onto those in a bit. Um, one of the main issues for me right off the bat is the story. And this is an issue that I have with this, with Never Say Never Again, the sort of semi remake of this film and with the Fleming story itself as well. Um, it's oh. just not a, a, it's not a story that I've ever really connected with. And it is like, it's huge. It's like, expect to have some big nuclear bombs and Bond has to go and find them and all this kind of stuff. But um, it, 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 it feels like there are less twists and turns in it. It's kind of like Bond has one mission and it's like, right, go find these things. Mm. And he goes and he looks around for about an hour and a half and then he finds them. And, and that's kind of it. Whereas you compare it to something like Octopussy, which has so many, you know, it's the Fabergé egg and then it's the jewels and then it's the nuke on the, on the, um, the circus cannon and all that kind of stuff. So, so the story right off the bat, and this is something going back to Fleming, as I say, that's never quite worked for me. Is it something that bothers you? Well, clearly less, because I, I do <laughs> love this movie and the story. But I will tell you, um, it's a very interesting point out that you do. And it was a bit of a, a, a psychology test because I wanted to hear, you know, how would you sum up in, you know, a minute or less kind of mm. your disdain. And the story I know is is everything for you. And I applaud you for that. I think, you know, that's that's part of who you are. For example, when we talked about Quantum of Solace, I liked the A to B to C to D to E to F to G mm. type mentality of a Bond film just kind of running its cadence and course, whereas I think you like and I'll even call out Octopussy, has a little bit more espionage and intrigue and mystery and will he and won't he. This is, and it's the fourth Bond film. They were going by a formula at this point. It was formulaic. And unfortunately, I have to admit right off the bat, I think that's one of the reasons why I like the story. The story has Bond, um, you know, obviously sent on a particular mission. He starts out on a mission and he basically stays on that mission throughout there isn't a lot of you know falling down and pulling back mm -hmm. yes he gets into you know his his little uh pitfalls and his black holes but he doesn't really fall out of the story it stays very much the plot mm, no very much so i i think a big reason my disconnect with it is that particularly this we have this big long sequence towards the start of the film where we see everything, like we see the villains hijacking the planes, getting the bombs where they put them, how they hide them, and all these kinds of things. So it, it's weird that oftentimes in Bond films, we are discovering things along with Bond himself. Here, we, the audience, know pretty much everything. And Bond is sort of catching up with us throughout the mm -hmm. throughout the course of the film. And sometimes this can be very effective. Like, it's an old Hitchcock thing. Like he said, like, suspense is when the audience know more than the characters on screen. But when it's dragged out in this way and to this degree, I, I don't think it's effective at all. Particularly when you have scenes of you know Bond and Felix in a helicopter, like looking down at water for a, you know five ten minutes, however long it takes. Um, and and as a result of that, I feel like there's a lack of agency to what Bond is doing. He is mm -hmm. kind of actually Phil Nobile Jr., who uh, you know you've had on your channel before, yeah. Fangoria magazine. He described this film, and it's really stuck with me. He described it as a hangout movie. And not in a derogatory sense. He quite likes this film. But that makes so much sense to me in that it is Bond and a load of beautiful people like hanging around on beaches and by pool sites and all that kind of stuff. And um I, I think there's stuff to be enjoyed on that side of things, but it just means that I think the story suffers as a result. And I think that's what a lot of people tend to see. The, the ones that do not connect with Thunderball in any way, even casually like Phil Nobile Jr., um, it's almost like a taffy pull. So the plot and the story sticking on that is really stretched out. So you've got these long scenes of exposition, and and but some people really like that. Now I'll tell you why I like the plot and story. I think this is one of those that highlights something that I've had an issue with, with a lot of Bond films. And that is, and I think you've said it too, I want my Bond to be not only badass, but to be fun as well. Mm. And this story and the plot, quite frankly, allows Sean Connery as Bond in this film to stand out. Now, whether you want to say he stands out because he's against a very dull background and he has nothing <laughs> but to do to stand out, fine, I'll give you that. But he comes across, and maybe we can jump right into Bond as a person, he's having fun. 
He's yeah. confident. And I know that um, in some of your, your earlier reviews, you had talked about Bond and not taking things very seriously in this movie. But I almost find it that, you know, he's kind of sitting back and letting things wash over him. The Bond that we've lost, the Daniel Craig Bond of like, he cries when he's happy. You know, he cries when he's sad. He cries when he's angry. It's like, this isn't very fun. This is the fun Bond. You know, going through, you know, shrublands and, and going through and spying and smiling and, yes, the misogyny. You know, he just looks like he's having fun with it. But did you like that aspect of it? I did, actually, yeah. And, and that's something that I've come to appreciate the kind of older I've got with it. Because th there is a certain joy in just, well, Sean Connery as Bond is just terrific anyway. But particularly in From Us With Love, Goldfinger, and I think to a lesser extent Thunderball, but I think all three of them are kind of him at the sort of peak of his abilities. I think there's a little bit of that, you know, you only live twice boredom sort of sneaking in in Thunderball, but for the most part, like particularly in the casino scenes, when he's got the tux on and he's you know, at the gambling table facing the villain and all that kind of stuff, he's just so phenomenal. It is just like textbook Bond throughout this, throughout most of this film. Um, and, and he's terrific. I think he plays it with a more knowing than he does in some of his previous um, uh, adventures. But overall, I, I can't fault him all that much. Connery is fantastic. And, and by the way, this is a debate cheat. You know, for me to put up Connery right in the beginning of the conversation, <laughs> it's like, go ahead, man. I dare you to diss Connery. Go ahead. <laughs> if you want hate mail, send it to 285 Hampshire Drive. Um, but but the reality is, is that I truly do love his bond in this. And I'm going to go so far as to say, when I look at Dr. No, it was his freshman year. And I, I liked him in it, but I wouldn't say I loved him. He, he wasn't like the bond that I would pot pattern my life after. Um, and then you you had from Russia with Love where, you know, he's, he's hardened. You know, he's cool. He's matured. It's his sophomore outing. You know, Goldfinger, I feel like it's lazy to say that Connery was great in Goldfinger because it's iconic. You know, he plays almost like that iconic role. Thunderball to me was like when I'm pithy and sarcastic and I take the mickey out of people, but at the same time, I'm still trying to be cool. That's Thunderball Connery. And I think that from a pattern of what we love Bond, and even as we look at other Bonds after him, people, whether they consciously know it or not, think about Thunderball Connery because he does have that humor, wittiness, but man, you know, he can kill you. Even his funny lines, there was one, I love it, when Largo says to me, do you know much about guns? And he goes, no, I know a little bit about women. <laughs> I, I love those types of lines. And you dream of doing those types of lines in real life. So I apologize for the cheat. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, I mean, I'll, I'll praise Connery uh, to, you know, to the end of the day. It's, uh, and, and I agree with everything you said about, um, I suppose by this point, it's like you were saying, they knew what the formula was, like Goldfinger had kind of solidified things. And this film, um, it, it, they know what beats the, uh, it's an incredible bit of work. Here it feels a bit more obvious, and I don't know how much of that is me being like, oh wow, she sounds exactly like Honey Rider does in Doctor No. Um, but same with Largo as well. Um, I, I, and it's a shame because there are clips out there in like trailers and featurettes from the time and stuff where they have their natural voices and it works so much better, I think, as opposed to the voices that they end up with, which feel almost cartoony in a lot of ways. Yeah. And I think there is a disconnect for me with the performance there. It just doesn't blend together very well. So so it, it bothers you, the the dubbing. It does. It does. And, and, you know, it's unfortunate because, like, although I do like Domino, I think when I was watching it again this time, what I was reflecting on is why do I like Domino so much? There's there's the dubbing issue. There's, you know, she's definitely a kept woman compared to, you know, some of the other Bond girls that we've seen before. Um, I think what it is, is I like the writing and the circumstance. And what I mean by that is, number one, I like her bookends. I love how Bond meets her. You know, they're both under the water. He kind of does a mini rescue. There's the little tit for tat. Um, and I love that aspect. The other thing that I love about her is the ending. The fact that she actually gets to kill the bad guy, which we've seen in a couple films, but um, never so much as memorable as this one. So I, my conclusion with Domino is as a character, mm, I'll give you that, but I like her circumstances, if that makes sense. Oh, no, totally. Yeah. And I, I think the fact that they give her the big sort of boss kill moment at the end where she has the harpoon and she kills Largo, that that's really saying something, particularly at this point in the series history where, you know, 
Bond, they want Bond to be the hero, obviously, and and you know they give him all the heroic moments. To take away the big, you know, heroic moment at the end and give it to her, I think, is quite a quite a statement. And I think it's a, a successful moment in the film. I think it's more satisfying that she gets the the last laugh with Largo. By the way, you are so on brand that you actually used a video game terminology, boss. Uh, to, to, to actually note that point, which was good. I can't help it. So now we've got to move on to uh, yet another dubbed individual, Emilio Largo. Um, so Emilio, played by Adolfo uh, Celli. Uh, what did you think of the bad guy in this film? Um, again, similar to Domino, he's never ranked terribly highly for me. And I think a part of that is... Oh, I don't know if I want. I don't know if I want if the word bland is a very fair word to use because I think that there are moments where both performers do really well. I don't know if it's in the writing or if it's the dubbing and the disconnect that I have with it there, but um, it it just feels very straight down the line Bond villain. He's got the eye patch. He's got the nukes. He's got this plan. It's it's also wrote in that way, and I know that that's a. A really oh you even got the eye patch this is brilliant i'm just oh, saying fantastic. i'm just <laughs> <laughs> and i i know it's unfair to make those comments about such an early film in the series where they were just figuring out the formula and all that kind of stuff but similar to dr no the film for me it, it's it's some elements can be very vanilla and later films in the series, it's like, you know, vanilla with sprinkles and strawberry sauce or something like that. It's just they kind of build on it. And here it's just kind of the base. And I feel like I'm just getting a base Bond villain with Largo. I think I, I'm going to give you I'm going to give you a little something. Is it, oh, I always okay. call it a burnt offering during these debates. So my burnt offering to you is the guy Largo is coming off of one of a very strong villain. Goldfinger. Mm -hmm. I mean, they named the movie after him, for goodness sakes. So mm -hmm. he's definitely not a, as strong a presence or character or as interesting, quite frankly, as Goldfinger. But that's why I like him. And let me explain. Like I said, this movie to me is a James Bond movie. It highlights James Bond. So you've got kind of a weaker, you know, Bond girl, like we said, who highlights James Bond. You also have a somewhat neutral bad guy and largo the mm. one thing i'll say about largo is you know he he his style is incredible he dresses well but he sets up james bond for the best lines the best moments and what i like about him and again it's i think it's the writing i think it's maybaum's writing in this is that even in the beginning you know you know he's maniacal there is no question that he is evil from the point where you know he gets to park anywhere anywhere he wants i mean look he just gives the guy the stink eye and he's like badon, badon. um <laughs> french people are gonna kill me for that but they this guy is evil and he's so calm when people are getting like exploded in their chairs by blofeld and i mean this guy is the shit. so i think in creating a pure foil not an individual character you know not like some of our favorite bond villains but someone that can really highlight James Bond, I think it's actually a really good character. That's a really good point as well. I've never considered that, but you're totally right. Like sometimes all characters need to be in a Bond film is an excuse for Bond to shine. And that really is the case with Thunderball. Um, yeah, interesting. And he does have some great lines. I mean, I, we, we've talked about some of the lines when he when he's doing the whole like, you know, you know, you wish to put the evil eye on me. Um, this is just an excuse to show props to Calvin. That's this all we're doing. Great. And we're just happy. No, to I love it. it. Which, by the way. I will tell you, I had a laugh out loud moment in one of your earlier reviews when you talked about rings and tattoos that essentially scream out. Hi, I'm a Spectre agent. Do you, do you remember doing that in your earlier reviews? I do remember doing that one, yes, with some sellotape, I think, and a pan, maybe? You, you put a, Is you put that? a, and, and by the way, we're not going to show a picture here, insert picture. Always an interesting decision when a secret villainous organization decides to brand itself publicly. Hello everyone and welcome. As you all know, Blofeld, our number one, has made me brand director for Spectre. So me and my team are going to be introducing um, some new uniform measures that you must make sure you wear at all times. Please wear 
this uh, material at all times. First of all, we have, uh, these have already been issued, our uh, Spectre rings. Highly importantly, you will wear these at any time, uh, even in the presence of MI6. I'm afraid it's it's just policy. The second part of the uniform uh, is to take some sellotape and to then wrap it around your face like so. This is so that when you're out in the street, people can identify you correctly as a Spectre agent. The third and final part of the uniform is to take a frying pan and a spatula, and then start bashing your head with the frying pan spatula so that everyone around you definitely is fully aware that you work for a villainous organization as prestigious as Spectre. Uh, any questions? Any questions? Editor. Oh, um, no. Where you might have wrapped tape around the head, pulled the nose back, <laughs> and put a giant <laughs> pot on your head. I'm not saying you did that, but I'm not saying you didn't do that. I, I think I might have done, and then I got this ring instead, and then I was like, oh no, this is Ooh, this is just as good, actually. Ring. I do, I just have the From Russia With Love variation. Uh, but I do really like the Thunderball one, actually. The Octopus yeah, logo is, looks really cool. I don't cool. know if you could see it, but it's it's actually um, opalesque. It's pearlescent. That's so nice. And then it's got the little rings. Yeah, that's lovely. Oh, but, nice. but to that point, I mean, that is a funny moment where, and I think this goes back to your, you know, you love, if I can be so bold, you, we've known each other for years, you love the fantasy and the larger in life, the, almost the nonsensical aspects of Bond. But I think in this film, it almost got even too much for you, where you were like, they're basically wearing a sign that says, I'm a bad guy. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's cartoony for sure. And and I feel like a part of that is that they're you know they're they're sort of feeling like they have this formula fully established and they can play around with it and they've kind of embraced the fact that oh this is really larger than life actually like the previous three films you can get away with sort of being like well it's it's reality but slightly heightened Thunderball is nothing like reality it's just this completely which which I love in like you know Moonraker we talked about that um, and and many other Bond films as well um, but here it just it, it it does just feel a little bit cartoony to me and this is the one that you know if you see a parody in The Simpsons or whatever it's always you know. We have some nukes, Mr. Bond, and you must give us, you know, do this and give us money or we will detonate, you know, them in New York City or, or whatever. But I love that. It's the reason <laughs> why I can actually acquiesce some aspects of Moonraker. When it, it's so interesting to me, too, because as somebody that, you know, um, loves many of the, the more fantastical films, you know, whether it's Brosnan or more, to me, this is almost like, you know, it allowed those films to go, you know what, wink, nod, uh, go for it. But I, I've got to tell you, you know, this is, I'm going to do something now, which is, you know, heat and cold, the right application can be pleasure <laughs> or pain. I'm going to apply some heat in the most positive way because there is something, no matter whether I go back six years or three years in your reviews, you loved something about this film, not liked, loved. And that is Fiona Volpe. Oh, Talk yes. to me. Who doesn't love, I've never heard any Bond fan say, whether you like Thunderball or hate Thunderball, everyone loves Fiona Volpe. <laughs> and what, I think why? She's, why do you, she's, why? Well, I, I think she's the first time in the series that they do a femme fatale character. And uh, so in, in that way, she's sort of laying a lot of the groundwork. Pussy Galore and Tanya, they had sort of dubious moments. There was Miss Taro in, in Doctor No as well, I suppose. So there were females who sort of morality was perhaps a bit grayer than you would expect from um, from female Bond characters. But I think the actress is phenomenal. <laughs> I mean, she's so good at playing this very sinister villain character and yet maintains a sexiness to her as well. And you do think, I love that she calls Bond out as well. Like, you know, she has that speech about, oh, you know, all you have to do is sleep with a woman and then they hear the heavenly choir and switch to the side of right and virtue. And she's calling him out on that. And, and, and that's really effective. She's aware of him and she's like, no, you don't work on me, actually. I, I am who I am and, and, and this is it. Um, she gets some fantastic moments where she's like doing the clay shooting with Largo. She drives the car really fast. She's just, yeah, the whole package of, I don't think they do as well as her until Zenya on a top in Goldeneye in terms mm. of sort of female villain. I think she's just, yeah. I'm guessing that you're a, a big fan as well. Huge fan, huge fan. And I, I, you know, you bring up a good point because 
I'm wondering why they don't do that more because the, you know the ones that you named and even Electric King. I mean, I I I actually think the Bond franchise does you know the the Bond female villains incredibly well, um, and I'm sure it's 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 a choice of of, of actresses. It has to be, but. Um, Luciana, she does such an incredible job with what I call subtleties. And it's mm. not the bigger, larger than life moments, but it is these like, you know, little things like when she's talking to Duval and she's in bed and she kind of swings her, her hair over her shoulder and she goes, want to bet? You know, yeah. just so, like it's the little things or when she's in the bathtub, which I still don't understand why she's taking a bath on her stomach. But it, I don't care. Um, and he hands her the <laughs> shoes and stuff like that. And the, the look of disgust on her face, but playful disgust. I it, love that moment. It's so subtle. So every scene that she's in raises all ships. And that's, and I'll, I'm going to sound like a broken record. Another reason why I love this film is because it highlights Bond. When you have a strong femme fatale, villainous, but the two of them are going tit for tat against each other. It gives him something to play against, but she stood in her own. And by the way, I've got to show you this. So that armband that I had on before, yeah. it was actually signed by her. No. When I met oh, her. So cool. And I'm thinking to myself, like, oh, she's going to think this is so goomy. She's such a fan of that movie that she knew exactly what the symbol was from. She was kind oh, of my... geeking out. She took a picture with it, the whole nine yards. She's as charming in real life as as you know she was maniacally charming in the movie and i i'm so jealous i've heard like nothing but good things about luciana in real life like fans are just always talking about like how lovely she is how just pleasant and just really like you know you hear some you know they say never meet your heroes and all that kind of stuff and some celebrities you know if you catch them on a bad day or whatever it can you know not be the most pleasant of experience for a fan but her i've never heard a, a bad word she's just always sounds like such a, a fun classy lady She's amazing. She's amazing. All right. So, you know, now we've got to apply cold scientifically. <laughs> and that is Felix Leiter. Ah. Felix hmm. Leiter in this film. I'm going to offer first that to me, Rick Van Nutter was by far the weakest Felix. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, I do. I think it was a weak point. I think he was by the numbers. Um, I think he was a little stale, quite frankly. I think, you know, was he there to really help propel the story along or, or to help Bond? No. It felt like they wanted to put an implant Felix into the scene, and I just thought that his portrayal was weak. Yeah, uh, I, I suppose, my, to be honest, I forget that he's even in this film sometimes. <laughs> it's like he makes that little of an Point impression proven. on me. But I do think that my issues with him... And I, and I think the character being here is fine. I think that him and Bond in the Fleming book actually have a really good dynamic and, and they work much better um, as a pair in that in that version of the story. My issue with Felix is my issue with all of the allies that he has in Thunderball, because you have uh, Paula as well, um, Martine Beswick, and then you have Pinder as well. Um, and, and you've got this like little team that Bond has where it really could just be one of them or at least two like i don't think that you need to have so many people but and as a result of that they have to give so many lines to these different allies that are helping him out and it's like oh this would just be so much more concise and cleaner if you know maybe you didn't have pinder there or, or merged pinder and paula into one character something like that um because otherwise felix he makes very little impression for me as well but i know that a lot of fans really like his portrayal they feel like he's more in the spirit of the jack lord of dr no you know he's a bit younger mm -hmm. a bit hipper than some of the other felixes of the time but um never really connected for me i must say interesting and you brought up you brought up paula and obviously you know bender um let's let's dwell on that for a second because you did have a comment in your earlier reviews that you think paula is is dismissed and there isn't a lot of um sensitivity empathy sympathy if you will from bond it's like oh She's dead onward. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I never had thought about that until I heard that review. And I'll, I'll admit that he moves on quickly. But then I maybe it's my harshness, maybe, you know, my 52 years of age that I fall back on the fact that this guy is a spy assassin. So he's got to move on. He can't sit there and dwell and, you know, hold Mathis and then throw him in the dumpster. I mean, that comes later. So I, I'm actually OK with with her being dismissed. I do think she does a very good job with her particular role, even as quick as it is. 
Mm. No, and I, I agree with you, to, and I think Quantum of Solace is a good example of maybe why Bond shouldn't spend time <laughs> sort of mourning uh, fallen comrades. And I know that, like, Severin in Skyfall, that scene gets a lot of stick actually more than thunderbolt gets where bond is severine is killed and then bond just kind of carries on without uh, without much consideration and i i agree with you actually though i think it wouldn't feel right if he had to sort of you know have a moment's mourning for for paula in the basement of largo's villa i i suppose my issue with it coming back to it now is that i don't feel like it does much going back to story again it doesn't do much story-wise. Like often in Bond films, when his allies or someone gets killed, it's often a motivation for him to like go and you know take down the villain and all that kind of stuff. Um, even in Octopussy, where he says, you know, that's for 009 when he kills uh, one of the twins. So there's a purpose to to the death. Whereas here, it, it again, it, it it just doesn't feel like it's doing all that much for the story. So I guess if they're going to go to the effort of having this character and then killing her in this way, I, I would have preferred it to have a greater impact on something. Yeah, and yeah, and it's a good point. I mean, I think that if they were going for an impact, it was probably missed. If we're sitting here and dissecting it and can't find it. All right, I'll tell you what, you know, we, we've been talking for a little bit. Um, and Calvin, I think I know you well enough that I'd like to take a break. And I'd like to take you to a spa with me. I think I think we'll have a great time. We've been a lot of stress, a pandemic, politics. Um, so we're going to go to Shrublands. And I, I'd like to introduce you to uh, Mar Molly Peters, all right, who okay. <laughs> massage, no strings attached, et cetera. But what did you think of Molly Peters and the interaction with Bond? Oh, okay. <laughs> How long have we got? <laughs> As long um, as you want. <laughs> um, again, I, I think that, oof, okay, I'm going right into the meat of this, which Absolutely. is uh, Bond and her in the steam room together, Bond kind of forcing himself on her. I know that that gets an awful lot of commentary, um, you know, the misogyny aspect of it and all that kind of stuff. And I do think that a lot of the issues that I have with it are down to the actress herself and how she plays it. Like, hmm. there's a couple of times where Bond is kind of like making the moves on her and she pushes him away and says, behave yourself, Mr. Bond. And she plays it in a, from a point of like genuine anger. Like she does not look like she wants anything to do with this man. And I think the, if she'd have played it slightly differently, like maybe, you know, in a kind of hard to get kind of way. And I know that that still is a, you know, would have been a problematic thing by today's standards, certainly, you know, consent and all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, just because someone's playing hard to get doesn't mean that they actually, you know, want to have sex with someone and all that kind right. of stuff. But I, I do think that those scenes suffer because of that, because it makes me feel uncomfortable <laughs> that he's yeah. kind of, and that he essentially blackmails her into having sex because he's stuck on this, one of the worst scenes in the film, he's stuck on this like rack sort of thing and he's like bouncing back and forth and then she comes and releases him. And then he basically says, you know, I want to get you fired <laughs> if you don't have sex with me now. And then she does that. So I, I don't think that that's aged terribly well. Um, and not way, that's a great that's a oh, great sorry. way that you phrased it where uh, the reason I even bring it up is I've 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 been telling when I had a, a conversation with Lisa Funnel, for example, we were talking about this whole thing of seeing, for example, a 1965 film uh, through 2020 or 2021 eyes. And it is hard, even somebody, you know, my age to look at that and go, well, that just seems perfectly playful. You know, uh, <laughs> happens every day. Um, no, of course not. And and I think a lot of it is is really that whole thing of letting things wash over you, almost looking at it in a historical way. Now, mm. I will tell you what what was interesting to me in watching this again is they really did write this in as Bond can turn any woman. Here's this angry woman that he's being, you know, quite rude to. And suddenly in the end, you know, there's mink gloves aplenty. And, you know, she's she's already begging for him as he leaves Shrublands. Like, when are you coming back? And he's like, see you later, irrigator. Um, to me, that is that whole forward motion of saying Bond is a fantasy character, fulfilling possibly the fantasy that not reality of most men's lives, but the fantasy of it. And and that's so I'm not saying it's a it's a forgive or a pass or like that, but I can almost see how they wrote it, if you will. And actually 
honestly, the, I, I, this is why I love having these debates because things occur to me and I'm like learning things all the time. It, it's interesting that you pointed out that, yeah, it's showing that Bond can turn sort of, you know, any woman, he can work his, you know, uh, charms on someone and they'll go to bed with him. It, it, it works very nicely with what happens later on in the film where that doesn't happen with Fiona. And so it's kind of a nice setup for that moment. Again, that's never really occurred to me until now. So thank you for that, David. Really it's all foundational writing. I mean, it's all yeah. there. It's amazing. And that's why this is the perfect film. This has been David Zariski and Calvin Dutton. <laughs> so many times we just needed to end this. Um, so so one of the things I do want to not ignore, because I, I quite like him, but maybe for different reasons than you might, or you might not like him, and that is Count Lippe. Oh, okay. Who doesn't yeah. have an amazingly long role or not even amazingly important role. But what did you think of him as a character in the film? Oof. Again, he kind of fades into the background. Uh, similar to my pro issue with Felix, actually. Yeah. Um, there are so many incidental villains in this. Like, you have Largo and Fiona who are, you know, uh, Fiona's fantastic. Largo might not be, you know, my favorite, but you know he's the main villain and, yeah. and Bond needs to get him and all that kind of stuff. But then you have Count Lippe and then you have Vargas and then you have the nuclear physicist guy whose name I can never remember. <laughs> who just appears. Like, yeah, who just vanishes out of nowhere. Um, uh, so, so yeah, uh, Lippe kind of falls into that similar um, category for me. And his, his and Bond's interaction is quite strange. I find that whole sequence at Shrublands really strange because he, when he comes in and turns the rack machine on Bond and then Bond kind of gets his own back by putting a broom through the door of the, right. um, the box sauna thing. Um, but then a couple of shots later, Lippe's suddenly in another location. He's outside Fiona's place on the phone booth, and that's kind of confusing. Um, but he has a cool tattoo. I, uh, but you, you, you like him? Well, I, I, not particularly. So but <laughs> what I do like about him in kind of reflecting back on the film is um, there is this cat and mouse spy versus spy, you know, you got me, I got you type thing that happens almost like a separate compartment in the film itself. And of course it's Shrublands, it's the going back and forth. That I do like, but it was very interesting, maybe a test, to see how much you remembered because a lot of people don't even connect with him at all. It's almost like to show the fun playfulness of Bond going back and forth. But does he, does he have a significant role? Not really. Mm, yeah, and I mean he's off like you know by the villain as well. Like right. Fiona comes in and um, under orders from Spectre, and she dispatches him quite quickly. It's it's again, and then oh god, and then you've got the whole face transplant. Um, Domino's brother Patachi um, in there as well. I just remembered him as well. Yeah. And it's oh, there are just so many characters in this that I feel like oh, if you just merged them together, maybe it would make for a neater narrative. Um, and and he's one of them, I, I think. Well, let's talk about narrative let's talk about story in alignment to locations and the reason i'm bringing up locations is it is going to dovetail to talking about the aquatic nature of this film which we ah. cannot ignore but <laughs> from a location standpoint a lot of this film is being and 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 is herald as one of the um i love it when they're you know they've got the parade and everything um i i, I mean i'm a geek for like i watch like BBC shows where it's just like newsreel footage of like, you know, the streets of London from like 50 years ago. I love that kind of uh, historical context and seeing yeah. that kind of thing. So I do get an awful lot out of that. And it's, it's a beautiful looking film, like you said, I think it, it's just stunning. It's the first like proper widescreen Bond film as well. Yes. So they get a lot out of that. It's, it's a stunning film, definitely. That's right. I think it was the first one to be in that kind of wide Panavision type thing in the colors, even the, 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 the critics, the reviews, um, some of them were, were harsh. Most of them were positive back then, but they said that it was a very, you know, the prime colors were really yeah. coming out. I'll tell you, and I'm a geek and you know, this about me with, with lifestyle when they show mm -hmm. Bond and the ancillary characters living their life. So for me, the parts where they're having conch chowder, you know, coming out of the water, um, they're drinking a rum Collins, like normal everyday type life thing. This movie's filled with them. And I think what happens is because we're luxuriating in the locations and the life of Bond, people tend to think this is a pretty slow film. And I think it's been one of your complaints. It's like that taffy pull of like, wow, things are really being drawn out to the point where nearly a quarter 
25% of this movie is underwater, <laughs> uh, which has really bothered some people, maybe you. Yeah, I'm one of them. <laughs> Talk to me about that. The, the climax in particular, where it's, you know, Largo's men against the, the um, CIA folks, and then Bond's kind of caught in the middle doing, you know, pulling masks off people and all that kind of stuff. It's it, it's beautiful. Like, I'll say that, first of all. And the fact that that was filmed, it's, it's a marvel that they could even choreograph such a sequence underwater with so many people. It's insane. That being said, <laughs> it's so slow. All right, that's the last of it. Now, question is, do I spend the next couple of hours watching this paint dry or watching the Thunderball underwater scenes? Paint dry it is. Oh, and it's, you can kind of tell the bad guys from the good guys and Bond's doing things in between, but particularly because I find the music in that sequence quite abrasive and very loud and brassy, um, which, which I, I don't feel matches very well with the kind of the slower pace of what you're seeing um, underwater. That's it. I'm having flashbacks. It like, it triggers me, that music. <laughs> Um, and I think you can do underwater battle sequence as well. I think that a part of the appeal of this probably at the time was the novelty of seeing it. And, and that's kind of, you have to view it in the context of the time to properly enjoy it, I think. And when I see it like that, I can enjoy it. It does not exhilarate me though, as like a big battle sequence at the end of a Bond film. It doesn't have the same effect on me like, you know, um, The Spy Who Loved Me, when they're in the Liparis and all of the soldiers are fighting each other. Or Moonraker um, when they're in space. I, I mean, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> Sl it moves well, slowly, but I think it, it works. <laughs> it moves slowly, right. So this was this was the point where I, there was some surprise, but maybe not other surprise. A lot of people said about Thunderball, people who don't like Thunderball, they basically say, anytime the actors' heads are above water, it's a great film. <laughs> anytime they go under, not so much. It slows down. And I can't really, I don't have a defense on that because... Even today, by my oldish standards, um, it does have a pacing issue. And, and it did back then. I, I looked at some of the old reviews at the time thinking like, oh, they must have loved this because it's so exotic. You're underwater. But no, they got dinged back then. And there was a theory. Maybe this is another new thing. There was a theory yeah. that Kevin McClory was so in love with the whole uh, diving underwater scenes that he kept saying more put in more, put in more. And so instead of this tight battle scene that works well because it leaves you wanting more, this one leaves you wondering, you know, is your popcorn stale? You know, <laughs> what time is it? Can I, can I wait to go to the bathroom? Yeah. Um, and that's unfortunate. I think it is a ding that might be appropriate for this film. That's really interesting because uh, honestly, I, I don't often go to, contemporary reviews of Bond films, like from, you know, the time. Yeah, no, I, I really need to do more of it because it's, I, I find that really surprising. I thought like back then the underwater sequences would have been, you know, what everyone loved because maybe it was just a novelty. And, you know, I've seen, I've seen like Creature from the Black Lagoon and those kinds of older movies where they do the underwater thing and they do kind of linger on it. And I yeah. understand that it was a novelty of the time. Um, but maybe even by Thunderball, actually, yeah, because I guess Creature would have been about 10 years prior. So maybe by Thunderball, the novelty had perhaps worn off a bit. And I think or it's maybe... a pacing thing more than anything, yeah. because in one of your, I feel like I'm quoting your your reviews, you must hate this. Um, in one <laughs> of your older reviews, you said, does that even work to throw a punch underwater? Which I thought was, a, you know, very interesting and, and, and not a bad <laughs> point. But I, I think that it's less about the fighting and the gadgets and the weaponry underwater and the fact that when you tell a good story, you don't have to keep adding things that don't forward that story along. It's one of the reasons why I like the Bond movies. They move at a quick pace. Mm. This one almost puts on the brakes in that particular area. Yeah, no, I, I very much agree. Uh, yeah, no, completely. And, 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 they, and they like shot a shark through its head, which is really... I, I always like get a little bit like, oh, whoa, it's, you know, just such an odd moment of 
animal cruelty on screen. Well, that kind of so yeah, if you read some of the stories about what they did with animals just generally in film back oh, then yeah. to horses and to it, it is, yeah, it's really bad. And, and, you know, as much as I'm like, well, you shouldn't see it through 2020 eyes. Um, there was just some really nasty, like they would take dead sharks and just pull them along and things like that. And just, oh, wow. there are some pretty yucky things going on with that. It's just one of those things that, like, no matter what, how old the movie is or whatever, it, it is always just going to get a reaction. It's like in Friday the 13th, they, like, cut a snake in half, or I can't, I can't believe I'm bringing up Cannibal Holocaust, but in that film, they kill this really big, beautiful, like, tortoise turtle creature, whatever it is, and it's just really, like, uh, yeah, it's just very unpleasant. It's kind of icky. <laughs> but other than that, a happy film. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, with a, a happy with a, film. Yeah, with a title like that. You know? <laughs> By the way, um, Thunderball, we got to talk about some of the bigger, larger than life things. I had to get the aquatic thing out of the way. You are a fan of the opening titles, the Maurice Binder with the titles. Are you also um, not just the titles, but the song itself? Um, I, I, I like the song. It's, it's mm -hmm. you know, I, I guess, you know, in, in ranking terms it'd probably be somewhere in the middle but i quite like it it's uh it's it's quite bombastic i'd, pro I'd probably prefer it to goldfinger in all honesty um and the the opening title sequence is really cool it's like the first proper maurice binder like you know, rotoscoped animation like beautiful naked women like going around and all that kind of stuff and beautiful colors um yeah i i, I think it's a really a really strong one how do you feel about it I, I love it, but I, I love the soundtrack too. I'll start with that. Mm. Um, the soundtrack, I love when Bond soundtracks match the action or support the action of the mm. film. So when he's sneaking around um, Palmyra, you know, Largo's estate, for example, the, the soundtrack follows his footsteps and his moments perfectly. And, and you know, even the movements of, of the bad people, the villains, mm. the music matches and connects to that. What I love about the song Thunderball is an issue that I have with present day songs. Um, I love that you can sing it and hum it, you know, mm -hmm. and he strikes da -ga -da -ga -da, like Thunderball. That was terrible. Yeah. Thunderball. <laughs> yeah, okay. uh, I enjoyed it. You can do I the whole song. I loved I love it. it. I loved it. And the other thing is to me, if you listen to the words, it encapsulates bond, you know, mm -hmm. other men just do this, not bond. He does that. Other men yeah. do that. Not nah, man. He's amazing. He does this. I mean, that's essentially what the whole song is about. So Thunderball is not Operation Thunderball in the song. Bond is Thunderball. And the way he strikes is so bombastic and hard and robust that he's like Thunderball. I mean, I just, I don't know. There's just something about it. I think it's magical. Yeah, I, I think it's it's strange that that, you know, whenever you hear or see like tributes to Bond or whatever, it's always nobody does it better, which is a phenomenal song and all that, you know, it's always set to montages and that kind of thing. I think Thunderball is quite an underrated one when it comes to sort of retrospectives of James Bond in that respect. The score, I it, it, it has that same gold finger, like in some places I feel like it's too much, it's just too <laughs> abrasive. I love the quieter moments where the Thunderball song is like, it's in the theme and like the bit where Fiona Volpe is, you know, she has her speech about uh, heavenly choirs and all that to Bond. And the music in that scene is so nice and so like silky and velvety. It's just, it's so lovely. I really like the quieter moments and same thing where, um, you know, Bond is telling Domino about her brother and all that kind of stuff on the beach. Again, there, I think it just, it works so nicely. It's perhaps just in the action sequences where I'm not a massive So you have fan. extremes, if anything. It's like either hot or it's cold applied scientifically. Exactly. Yes, it's it. lukewarm. There's, there's a lot of that. <laughs> all right. So this is going to be a shocking moment for you because I'm going to read this. Uh, first of all, uh, Thunderball still to this day even despite your opinion, is the most financially successful film of the series in North America, if you count that, uh, when adjusted for ticket price inflation, huh. even outside of all the other films. So it's, it's incredibly popular. And although it gets dinged for a lot of like effects, like when, you know, they're sitting on the boat at the end and Domino and Bond are talking kind of casually and you know, the rocks are coming and, oh, you know, yes. the, the back screen and stuff like that. In 1966, John Steers won the Academy Award.
for best visual effects, which mm -hmm. is amazing. But my point being is this remains a beloved, nostalgic James Bond film. Has it mellowed? Has your appreciation grown over the years for this film? Oh, definitely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, like I, I would have once, um, you know, have said perhaps to a lesser degree than some of the others like License to Kill for me. But uh, I think I, I've. I, I've come to understand better what I can appreciate out of it and kind of let go of the things like, yeah, I think the story lags and I don't like parts of the music or the action sequences or whatever. I can let that go and I can just enjoy the visual splendor of it. And it is just, maybe I don't even need to see it with the dialogue and I can just watch it like without any of that because it's just such an attractive film and attractive people doing fun things <laughs> and it's like yeah. I, I appreciate it from that aspect of it it's still not one that i go to you know stick in the in the blu-ray player on a regular basis it still ranks quite low but i i appreciate that side of it has it always like been one of your favorites like when yeah. how old were you when you came to it for the first time do you remember yes i was very young so mm -hmm. when my father i i think the spy who loved me Rainy day in Atlantic City, we went and saw this film called The Spy Who yeah. Loved Me. And I'm like a little kid who loved Batman, the 1960s, 68 type uh, TV show. So I'm yeah. like, what is this? And then I was just enthralled. And I remember afterwards, my father saying, well, if you love that film, you know, there's another one on TV. And I remember Thunderball, probably, believe it or not, my first Sean Connery was Diamonds Are Forever. Oh, wow. And as a kid, I loved it because it was... Yeah. It was silly. It's all the reasons why I'm like, meh, now. But um, I remember seeing it shortly thereafter, and I just grew up with Thunderball. So whenever ever it was on, and then when I started to get into this part of the hobby, this meaning like lifestyle stuff, to me, and you and I have talked about this, I don't think there would be an argument here. From a lifestyle perspective, Thunderball is one of the best mm. Bond movies. You know, whether it's his casual clothes or his suiting or you know, the way he looks or, you know, appropriately dressed, like he's not wearing a tuxedo walking around in the Bahamas. He's wearing this shirt, essentially, and, and, and sandals, which a lot of people don't realize Bond wears sandals, like in a lot of films. Get over it. Um, but I just, I think that there's just something about it that I'm going to, I'm going to call it this. It's a very comfortable, warm, fuzzy blanket for me. It's oh, just nice feels very familiar. I can put it on. I can relax. I can actually walk away from the film and it keeps playing in my mind as I fix myself a drink. Like I don't need to be in front of it. It's just wonderfully familiar. Oh, that's lovely. Yeah. No, and I'm certainly not going to ding that. Like I think. Better not, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I think like you, you, uh, there are many Bond films that provide me with that same kind of warm fuzzy feel, like Moonraker, for instance, which we yeah. talked about as well. That's that's one of those for me, and I think, yeah, the lifestyle aspect is something that I really do have to thank you with, sort of bringing to my awareness, really, of of like what that even means, because I think sometimes I can be quite uh, honed in on like story and character, and that's kind of you know script structure and all that kind of stuff, and I think sometimes. Particularly, I mean, lifestyle is a part of Bond, and it's there in the Fleming, you know, like it's yeah. it's baked into the into the cake. Um, and I think it took me a long time to kind of appreciate and understand what what that really meant, like yeah. when it comes to like you know watching a film. And um, and I totally see what you mean and why this would stand quite highly for you because of that. Well, it's interesting because the traditional Bond fan. I mean, the ones that saw Thunderball probably first run in the theater. Mm -hmm. So they've been around for a while. They've been fans for a while. So I salute them. They've had their cards, James Bond fan cards for a while. Um, they've always talked about, for example, locations. Location's been a very natural, very unassuming thing. You have to talk about Bond locations. To me, lifestyle is as important as locations. But mm -hmm. typically, up until about five or six years ago, people didn't talk about it. Now you've got an entire generation in fact, most of my audience on my YouTube is about the lifestyle. And, and I think what it is is that people will come to my YouTube channel not from Bond sites, not from the Bond community, but from watch sites or mm -hmm. style and fashion sites or grooming sites. Like I look at the analytics and they're like, well, the, you know, James Bond lives the lifestyle that I emulate. And, 
So I think if you don't look at lifestyle in these films, you're actually missing a really important component. No, I, I completely agree with that. And, and, and like I say, I have to thank you very specifically for kind oh. of uh, bringing my sort of understand, like heightening my understanding of, of this area, because I think it is a really important part of Bond that, you know, doesn't often get talked about an awful lot. Not like, you know, not like all of the not other ingredients of like, you know, girls, yeah. gadgets, cars, all that kind of stuff. So I'm waving so the flag, man. I'm waving the flag. <laughs> um, all right. So we're going to end this with a really important question because, uh, and again, it's about past and present tense. Uh, in the past, you rated Thunderball as literally the bottom of the barrel for Bond films. In fact, in one review, you actually said it might be your least favorite. It's like mm. the very last place. Um, whether it's this discussion, your maturity, your wise intelligence, as opposed to back then, um, has it climbed up the ladder? Oh, certainly. Yeah, definitely. Um, I number, mean, two? Been... number two? Number <laughs> two? Yeah, number two behind license to I kill. pushed too hard. <laughs> I pushed him too hard. <laughs> no, it, re it really has. I mean, like I said, there are very few Bond films that I would say I dislike, even if, you know, dislike is a word that I can use in relation to Bond. Um, it's only really when you put it into rankings that you kind of think like, oh, yeah, maybe it's... But um, but no, it's... Like, like I say, it's... I, I feel like I appreciate elements of it an awful lot more and my understanding, again, similar, you know, lifestyle thing again, um, the time capsule aspect of it as well is another thing um, that I've just come to appreciate so much more as I've gotten a little older and and I, I take solace in, in that whenever I'm watching it. But it's not a, it's certainly not at the very bottom of my rankings uh, anymore. My job is done then. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, Calvin, thank you so much. By the way, we're going to have to dream up and, and talk about over the holidays uh, what our next debate's going to be. Mm, I know. I, you know, I, I've already got some ideas. So, uh, All right, we'll, we'll yeah. talk about it. I won't put you on the spot. All right, well, <laughs> Calvin, thank you so much for this comment. And as usual, the time flies. And, you know, I, I also want to say to the people watching right now, um, you're a bit of a fly on the wall because Calvin and I would have these conversations, whether we were recording or not. This is just fun for us. So we're happy to invite you into the conversation. But leave your comments below. Where do you stand with this? Maybe maybe your team Calvin, maybe your team David, maybe your team David Calvin. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> let us know for sure. And Calvin, thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure as always. So thank you very much. You're welcome. And of course, this has been David Zeritsky for The Bond Experience. We'll see you all real soon. Take care. Thanks for watching this episode. If you want to be up on the latest from The Bond Experience, just click on this subscribe and subscribe to our channel. You're going to get all the latest and greatest information, plus some exclusive content. And by the way, speaking of content, here's something especially for you, just because we know you. Talk to you soon.